Hi there. Welcome to Erickson Science with me, Mr. Erickson. So what did you learn from the question of the day? You learned that this football is moving, but motion is relative. Relative to the desk, this football is not moving. Relative to some outside source, like the moon or something outside the earth, this is moving. All motion is relative. And what do you need to create a change in motion? You need a force. What is a force? A force is any push or pull on an object. Anything, all right? Here's an example of a force. It's a trick, it's just a trick. It's a string attached to a thing. So that's, uh, that's not really the force. The force isn't real. A force is any real push or pull on an object. What is the most obvious force around us right now? Give you a hint, it's keeping you on the ground right now. It is gravity. Gravity is what's pulling everything down right now. If it's on or around this earth, it is affected by gravity. Everything is affected by gravity. So, a couple cool things about gravity. First off, We're gonna do a couple of experiments that show that the higher an object is, the more force it exerts when it lands. So if I take this and I hold it here, it has that much force. If I take this and I hold it like this, it has even more force. And if I take this and hold it way up high, there's even more force there. What does that tell us? It means that gravity is always acting on this, always changing its motion, always making it go faster, all right? Gravity is influenced by two things. One, the size of the object, and two, the distance from the object. Every ob everything, every piece of matter, me, the football, this brick, the air, all have gravity, meaning they are all pulling things towards it, all right? Now the two things that affect gravity are the size of the object, the amount of mass there is, and the distance from the object. So now my question is, what is the largest, closest object to you right now? It's not my house, it's not my shed, it's not the school? The answer is the Earth. The Earth is the largest, closest thing, so it has the most gravity by far. It has so much gravity, it pulls things down at that rate right there. If there was less gravity, it would pull it down at a slower rate. It would create less force. Therefore, it would pull it down at a slower rate, all right? It has that much gravity. Now think of the mass of me compared to the mass of the Earth. Who has more mass? Definitely Earth. By how much? A gazillion times more. So therefore the Earth has a gazillion times more than me. So this football is being pulled towards me right now, okay? But the problem is uh, uh, my gravity is so much smaller than the gravity of the Earth, just like my mass is so much smaller than the mass of the Earth. Therefore, it barely even feels me. It's infinitesimally small, just like my mass compared to the mass of the Earth. Now, what is the other thing that affects gravity? Distance, okay? The moon is a very, very large object nearby us, but it's so far away, it only exerts a little bit of gravity on us, enough to change the liquid on the, the Earth a little bit to give us tides, all right? And that's what makes the water kind of move around and makes our tides go up and down. The sun is so much bigger than the moon and the earth, but it's so far away. It only exerts, it exerts less gravity than the moon, all right? Um, now, who has more gravity? The, the, 
brick or the ping pong ball, okay? Think about how heavy this is. The earth is acting on this more so than this, all right? More gravity, less gravity. And now we could say this weighs less and this weighs more because gravity is pulling this down more than this. So when you have gravity, this object is being pulled down right now, right? We all know that because it's around this earth. Therefore, there's gravity pulling it down. All right. So therefore, so why then is it not traveling downwards? There has to be some force counteracting that gravity, some force canceling out because motion is not changing on this brick. It is not going down. Therefore, there's got to be some force pushing back on it. And that is called, that force is called the normal force. It's the force of support. It's the force pushing up from this object that is canceling out the gravity. The bigger the object, the more normal force. The smaller the object, the less normal force. You can imagine if this object were so big, you would not be able to support it with this bench. It would break the bench, not enough normal force to, uh, to keep this up. Normal force is the force of support. The most obvious force that there are is out there is something called an applied force. That is any obvious push or pull. I'm exerting on an object. This is the applied force. And if I look at my Incredibile here, and I make a little wall right here, and I take my Incredibile, and I turn it on, and I turn it on, and I make it go forward. Come on, Incredibile. Eventually, it's going to hit the wall with an applied force, and it's gonna crash the wall, just like that. All right, thank you so much for all your help, Incredibile. That is an applied force. Anytime there's an obvious push or an obvious pull, that is an applied force. Another type of force that you see a lot in every day is elastic force. It is the force that when I pull this balloon, it snaps back, okay? What force is pushing the air out here? Elastic force of the balloon wanting to go back to its original shape. Here is a great example of elastic force. A little bit later in the video, we're gonna do an experiment with this. But what is the force pulling my arms together right now? Elastic force, all right? When the ball bounces, what is the force that makes it bounce? Elastic force. Elastic force is when you change the shape of something and it wants to go back to its original shape. When I bounce this, it compresses the ball and it wants to go back to its original shape, pushing it up in the air. Um, a spring is an example of elastic force. Um, a bending piece of wood is an example, or metal is elastic force, as long as it wants to go back to its original force. If I pull this and it goes back, all elastic force. And finally, the last force we're gonna talk about here is a force that kind of is the anti-force. It's the force that resists motion. It's the force that wants things to stop moving. And it is the force of friction. So I'm gonna show you some friction force here. I have this object here. And there's a few different kinds of friction force we're gonna talk about. Kind number one is static friction. This is the friction of something that is stopped 
and then as I pull it, it starts moving, all right? This is called static friction. And if I sit there and I pull on this a little bit, it's not moving. Why? Because of the static friction, okay? How can I increase the static friction? Two ways. I could change the surface. This is sandpaper. Now there's more static friction, all right? Um, how else can I increase the static friction? I can add mass to this, make it push down. Now there's a lot of static friction. Whoops, oh here look, there's more static friction between these two than there is between the surface of the table and the wood. Therefore I'm pulling the whole thing. Very nice, let's see if I can, there's some static friction. Static friction also prevents this from sliding down like that. Once the gravity overcomes the static friction, friction, we get a change in motion, just like that. Now, if I do the same thing on this, I would hypothesize it'll need a greater angle to overcome gravity. Oh. Now, the gravity force became greater than the force of friction, therefore, it started going down. Now, if you could imagine, oh boy, <laughs> lots of gravity, but also lots of friction because it's, it's very heavy. Another type, type of friction is sliding friction. Sliding friction is the friction of something rubbing against something, slowing it down, all right? Sliding friction is any force that rubs against and slows something down. Sliding friction gives off heat. That energy that is moving is transferred to heat energy. That's why when you rub your hands together, create some sliding friction, it gets warm. That's sliding friction. Another type of friction is rolling friction. If I roll this, eventually it's gonna to come to a stop because of rolling friction. Rolling friction can also be seen like this. If I take my object here that I was pulling before and I now have rolling friction. Rolling friction was in the Incredibile as it's rolling along. Rolling friction you see in cars and anything with wheels rolling, you, it, you have rolling friction. Another place you see rolling friction is with a ball. A ball getting uh, uh, rolling along and eventually coming to a stop. Comes to a stop because of rolling friction. And finally, one friction that is invisible is friction due to moving air. It's a type of sliding friction of the air sliding past an object as it's traveling through air. I want you to see this ball right here. See this ball? I'm gonna throw this ball as hard as I can. All right? Okay, so I just threw it as far as I can and it only went this far. Why did it only go this far? Because of wind resistance. Wind resistance is the friction of the air hitting the ball, slowing it down, all right? Gravity was pulling it to the ground, wind resistance slowing it down, and wind resistance is gonna act a lot more on this than a golf ball. Why? We'll talk about that later when we talk about Newton's laws. But slowing this ping pong ball down was wind resistance hitting it. Now, you, the faster an object goes, the less wind resistance it needs, okay? Or sorry, the faster an object goes, the more wind resistance it encounters. You running around the track, you get a little bit of wind resistance, but not too much. Car going 50, 60 miles an hour on the freeway, more wind resistance. An airplane going 700 miles an hour, lots of wind resistance, okay? Wind resistance increases as you go faster. Wind resistance is kind of an invisible friction force that slows you down as you travel through air. Okay, 
I wanted to talk a little bit about net force. Net force is not a force in and of itself. It is all the other forces added up that acts on an object. For example, if I have an object here, it could be any object. It could be a ball, it could be a car, it could be a can, it could be a brick, it could be anything. There is a downward force on that in the form of gravity. I'm going to label that with a capital G. My line isn't very straight. There's an upward force, as I mentioned before, that's the normal force. That is what is pushing it up. If we see these two arrows, they should be the same length. They are balanced, therefore there is no motion. Or I should say no change in motion, all right? Because these forces are balanced. Once one of these forces is greater than the other, then motion will change. If you have gravity going down like this, you have a very large gravitational force, you have a small normal force, then we have change in motion going in that direction. Therefore, the net force is in that direction. All right, let's try to get rid of some of this. Clear page. So let's do an experiment here. Let's pretend we have an object here, like a box. We have a person over here pushing that box with a force going this way of 10 newtons. A newton is the, for, is the unit we use to measure force. We have a smaller person over here pushing the box with a force of five newtons in that direction. What is the net force on this box and how is motion going to change? So it doesn't take much to agree. If I write this the other way, I'm going to draw five newtons going that way. I'm going to draw 10 newtons going that way. So we see we have a net force of five newtons going in that direction. That's the net force. Because why is that? It's because a little bit of this 10 is being canceled out by that five. This person's 10 newtons is being canceled out by this person's five newtons. Therefore, we get a net force of five newtons in that direction. And the box is going to change direction or move in that, or change motion or move in that direction. All right, let's clear page again. Let's give another one here. Let's just pretend we have another object here. All right. And we have, um, uh, we have, let's name all the forces now. We have gravity going that way. We have a normal force going that way. We have a person pushing it with a force in that direction of 20 newtons. We have a force, person forcing it in this direction of 12 newtons. What is the net force on this object? Now remember, all forces have a magnitude and a direction. So you have to say how big that force is, and you have to say the direction of that force. So the, mag the net force on this object is going to be 8 newtons. There's the magnitude. should be a capital N. And the direction is that way because again this 20 newtons is the normal and the gravity are canceling each other out no motion up and down we have 20 newtons going in this direction 12 in this one again that 12 is going to cancel out a little bit of that 20 if you subtract the two you get eight newtons newtons in that direction that is net force so here is an online simulation there's a link to it in Google Classroom where you could play around with net force. So you can take different amounts of force. You can take a very large force of 150 newtons to the left, and you can take a small force of 50 newtons to the right. And we see here we have a net force, which is the sum of forces, of 100 newtons to the 
left. This means that 50 Newtons are going to be canceled out by this little guy here. This little guy, this big guy is going to be pulling with 150. 50 is going to be taken away with a net force of 100 Newtons. If I hit go, can we predict what the change in motion is going to be? If you said the change of motion is going to be to the left, let's see if you're correct. Absolutely, we see that change of motion to the left. Now, what happens if we have nobody over here? Then we just have a net force of 150 to the left. There we go. But if we take someone, anybody here other than, oh, what if we take someone of the same size? Now we have zero net force, 150 cancels out 150, and we see zero change in motion. Why? Because the forces are balanced. There, like I said, there's a link to this. There's also other things you could play with. Here it is here. So we have motion going in this way. We have friction here. Um, and for the advanced people, we have acceleration. Go ahead and play around with this as much as you want. Speaking of friction, I wanted to show you one more thing with friction. Here, we have one of our old textbooks. Who says Mr. E doesn't use textbooks? Anyone says Mr. E doesn't use text textbooks? Show them this video, because I'm using one right now. I'm using two right now. So, what I did here was I took, and I took this and I Leaved every other page. So these two books are together with every other page overlapped on the other. What's gonna happen? Well, it's gonna create friction between the two pages. How many pages are in this? Each one of these has 230 or so pages that are touching the other 230 pages, which is creating a lot of friction. No matter how hard I pull this, it's not going to pull apart because of all the friction. There's no tape here holding this together. It's 100% friction holding these two together. <clears throat> friction in action. Okay, I told you before we were going to do an experiment with elastic force and gravity. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna see how you can use math to figure out things in science, all right? So don't worry, you're gonna have to do something for this, but you're not gonna have to do any math. Go to the link in Google Classroom that will take you to a calculator. That is a free fall calculator. What that's gonna do is that's gonna measure how long, because gravity's constant and it's a constant force, what's going to happen is it's going to, um, it can actually calculate based on how much time it takes to fall, how high the object was. Because gravity is constant, um, it's always going to act the same, and you can use math to figure out if it takes that long to fall, it's this high. If it takes this long to fall, it's this high. If it takes 43 seconds to fall, how high it is. Well, we're going to do two things. We're gonna measure something going up and then coming back down. So go ahead, go to that calculator, get your phones, get the stopwatch out, and meet me over on the grass. Okay, so get your phones out. What I want you to do is I want you to time how long it takes for this balloon to be launched in the air. The second I launch it, start your timer on your, on your phones. As soon as it hits the ground, I got the tracker in my pocket. I'm gonna to try to get to right where it lands so you could watch it land. As soon as it hits the ground, you're gonna stop. And we're gonna to try to figure out, using math, how far this, how, how long it took, or sorry, how high this balloon went, all right? We're gonna use some elastic force to get it in the air, and we're gonna use the force of gravity to get it back down. Are we ready?
So, that didn't work. I'm gonna try it again. I'm gonna try to shoot it straight up in the air. <laughs> All right, we're gonna try that again. That almost hit my cameraman. All right, <laughs> science isn't perfect. Reset your phones. From launch to landing. Ready? Mm-hmm. This one's good, this one's good, this one's good, this one's good. Stop! All right. Okay, so now you have the amount of time it took from launching to landing. Now we need half that time. So take that number, divide it by two, because we only need the time from the very tippity top when it went up from the very top to when it fell. So take your time, divide it by two, plug that into the formula in the link in Google Classroom, and it will give you how high that balloon traveled, that balloon went in the air. Um, that is one way you can use math to figure out science. So that's it for now. Do the Google form in Google Classroom, and if you have any questions, please see me in the afternoon for the help session. That's it for now. Thank you very much. And this is, I'm Carl Erickson. This is Erickson Science. This is Mr. Erickson signing off for Erickson Science. So long. <laughs> Here, this is Erickson Science. Thank you very much. <laughs> so long. <laughs> Softly. You should have said that last part earlier. <laughs>